Hi all, my name is Ryan and welcome to my channel What The Pop, where we discuss pop culture in general and Buffy a lot. The usual spoiler alert, I may talk about things in these analyses that relate to future plot points. So if you haven't seen all of Buffy at least once and don't like spoilers, I suggest you like the channel, then come back once you've seen it all. Uh, today we continue our look at Season 2 with my review and analysis of Episode 15, Phases. A plot summary. Oz notices the eyes on the cheerleader statue follow you. He and Willow have an awkward post-date convo. Willow runs off to Buffy. Larry is a misogynistic douche canoe. Oh, thank you, Thigh Master! Willow complains that nothing is happening, despite the anvil-sized hint she's dropped, and she calls Cordy a hoe. Cordy is frustrated because Xander won't stop talking about Willow and Buffy. They get attacked by a werewolf, and she gets all fast and furious with the escaping. Checking out the damage, Giles is way too enthusiastic about werewolves. Larry is a douche to Teresa, then he grabs a handful, and I mean an absolute handful, of Buffy's ass, and she sayonagis him across the room. Werewolves are active for three nights, we can't kill them, they're still human. Kane the werewolf hunter is the epitome of toxic masculinity and needs a kick in the nuts. Apparently werewolves are drawn to sexual heat. The wolf makes a guest appearance at the bronze, Buffy tries to capture the angry puppy but fails. Kane says any deaths are on her. Teresa is walking home, runs into Angelus. She gets snacked on. The werewolf and Angelus hiss at each other. Teresa's body is found. Oz wakes up naked in the forest, calls his aunt, finds out the cousin who bit him is a werewolf. Xander concludes Larry is the werewolf and confronts him. Not a werewolf, just a gay bear. Xander and Buffy go to check out Teresa and crap, she's a vampire, complete with a vampogram for Buffy. Xander dusts her. Willow visits Oz at home as he's about to chain himself up. He shifts and Willow does her best scream queen impression. Willow runs, Kane hears wolf cry and starts hunting. Willow tells Buffy and Giles Oz is the wolf, they're going to trank him like a Beverly Hills housewife. Buffy stops Kane shooting where Oz, Willow tranks him. Buffy bends Kane's substitute penis, I mean rifle, tells him to leave town. The next day, Larry is nice, thanks Xander for his help. Xander disapproves of Willow and Oz, Buffy says to butt the hell out. Willow still wants Oz, she kisses him. Oz gets the corniest line he will ever utter. This episode was written by uh, Dean Patali and Rob D. Hotel and is probably my favourite episode from this writing duo. They're, the episodes tend to be average episodes that are highly quotable. By that I mean the episodes are usually good but not great, but always seem to have some great moments in them and some great quotes. For example, they wrote Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, a very average episode, but one which contains one of Buffy's most well-known lines, If the Apocalypse Comes, Beat Me. They did, however, write The Dark Age, which is one of the episodes I find most disappointing because of how good it could have been. Having said that, I love this episode. The metaphor has no subtlety whatsoever. Kane's toxic, ma toxic masculinity is so over the top it's ridiculous. Larry's immediate transformation from misogynistic douchebag to nice guy when he finally acknowledges he's gay is completely unrealistic. And the werewolf costume is probably some of the worst creature effects that Buffy ever does. But I still love it because it still has so many of those little moments or lines that are just fantastic and is a light-hearted break from the emotional gut punch of innocence. And the thing with this episode is that everyone gets some great lines and moments. Oz is our major focus here and probably gets the most screen time he's had so far. And there is no one on earth who can deliver a huh with so much meaning like Seth Green. As I mentioned in the summary, he also gets his worst line ever in this episode. I talk often about the face acting in this show, 
Oz being in love could have been achieved with a look. The super corny werewolf in love line was really unnecessary. Especially considering Oz is a man of few words. Um, with just a look, it would have been a nice reflection of Willow's falling in love look from last episode. They could have shown him doing the same. Willow gets a few lines here that I find out of character. Her 1800 I'm dating a skanky ho comment is just something Willow wouldn't say. Xander would, but not Willow. Uh, but I'll talk about this later. Her bonding moment with Cordy on the couch at the bronze is quite fun and probably fueled way too much fem slash. Though it's entirely unrealistic given Willow was bitching about Cordelia earlier. It just ends up being an odd scene because it doesn't really fit the narrative or serve the metaphor. My favourite Willow moment though is when she gets to go on another of her I've reached my breaking point tirades. Uh, they are always entertaining. They do a really good job here of addressing the Angelus issue from last episode without it having to be the focus. Buffy, a little emotionally bruised, gets to bash the whole male species with this comment. Acts on, on, on pure instinct, no conscience, uh, predatory and, and aggressive. In other words, your typical male. On behalf of my gender, hey. Yes, let's not jump to any conclusions. I didn't jump. I took a tiny step and their conclusions were... As a male, I should be saying, hey, but I think it's just hilarious because it also describes Buffy to a T, which Willow comments on later. Giles gets some hilarious moments here, my particular favourite being this one with Kane. Well, it's good to get the fruit while it's fresh. You'd be wise to take that back. Hey, what a man and a girl doing lovers laying at night is nobody... Oh, hey, okay, hey, enough repulsive brain, it's not what you think. Just seeing Giles ready to manhandle the guy with a gun over his honour is hilarious. Xander keeps Larry's homosexuality a secret and doesn't insult him or use it against him in any way, which is honestly the most shocking thing about how the revelation plays out. His backpedalling on having felt the same way in a classic misunderstanding situation is actually quite funny. And Nicholas Brendan does a great job of selling that awkward teenage reaction to the situation. Xander gets another hero moment and also gets his best kill of the entire series in this episode with the staking of Teresa with the easel. Angelus only makes a brief appearance in the episode, but it's an effective one. He is creepily menacing here in a scene reminiscent of the Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood, where Little Red gets eaten and then using her to send Buffy a personalised vamp message. The werewolf has long represented a very primal force in humanity. Heather McCallum said of werewolves that they represent an examination of transformation in its broadest sense, uh, and the repressed internal self coming to the surface, with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the picture of Dorian Gray, and even the Incredible Hulk representing modern expressions of this trope. So werewolves are pure passion, acting on impulse and desire, and signify a loss of control, often through a painful transformation. Giles here describes the werewolf as a potent extreme representation of our inborn animalistic traits, and it acts on pure instinct. No conscience, it's predatory and aggressive. All these aspects are seen in Cain, and it's obvious here that Cain and the werewolf are a comparison. As a representation of toxic masculinity, long before that term existed, when we compare Oz and Cain, Cain is the one who comes across as a monster. Cain lacks any conscience, hunting werewolves despite them being people, and he wears a trophy, a necklace, containing a tooth from every werewolf he's killed. Eleven so far. That's eleven people that Cain has killed. Contrast that to Oz, and despite being an animalistic slave to his instincts, Oz has killed no one, and at least intended to shackle himself to prevent him from killing anyone. As we've talked about often this season, and what we'd expect from someone further along in their journey to adulthood, he took responsibility. Faith in season 3 will say every guy, from Manimal right down to Mr. I Love the English Patient, has beast in him. Oz as a man is too perfect, so he literally has to become a beast to counter and balance the human side. Through Kane, in his comment, they're suckers for that whole sexual heat thing, they link that inborn animalistic trait back to sex and desire, one of the major themes of this season. 
In this episode, we also get a direct contrast between Oz and Larry, our two bitten people. They represent two sides of the same dilemma, fighting desire. As I detailed with Oz in What's My Line, Oz's understanding of who he is, what he wants, and his respectful outlook on people and life in general give him a maturity and unique perspective in the show. He is measured and philosophical. As we saw with his treatment of Willow last episode, Oz is very respectful and considerate of her sexual maturation. He is very much in control of his desire. He tells Willow, I can wait. He isn't beholden to his animalistic urges. Oz goes through the painful change into a werewolf and loses all that. He has no control, no agency. He doesn't remember the change and can't recall anything that happened after he changed. He wakes up naked, having been drawn by sexual heat to the makeout spot and then the bronze. He is a slave to his instincts and in werewolf form is unable to control them. Back in human form, Oz is back in charge and immediately reverts back to his fairly controlled self. He acknowledges what he thinks he is, seeks confirmation and immediately goes about controlling it, about to physically shackle himself when Willow arrives. We will see these more primal, stereotypically male traits emerge from Oz on occasion in future episodes, such as next episode when he punches Xander. While Oz becomes an animal when desire and instinct is released, Larry is an animal for the exact opposite reason. Larry, in repressing his homosexuality, is taking out his pain and frustration on others with a hyper-masculine persona to mask his secret. By repressing his instinctual desire completely and engaging in this performative masculinity to hide that desire, Larry manifests his animal side as a misogynistic douche canoe, fueled by the fear he has of being gay, his internalised homophobia. Larry has been in an extended, painful transformation, one he was reluctant to go through. He says to Xander, what, you think you have a cure? Which reflects the wolf in Oz, something that also has no cure. But like most change, it is the fear of the unknown, in this case, how people will react, that actually drives the apprehension. When Larry is simply able to acknowledge that he is gay, it loses much of that fear, and we see how acknowledging and accepting his desire changes him for the better. In an episode about his desire, it's interesting to see Buffy's what-if version Cordelia's reactions. At the start, she expresses her desires, and when those desires aren't being met by Xander at that time, she calls him out on it and puts an end to that moment. Cordelia has complete agency over her desire, a direct contrast to Larry and Oz. Willow, Buffy's metaphorical spirit, is riddled with desire in this episode. She wants smoochies. She wants Oz to get an A in Willow, and her desire makes her catty, having a go at Cordelia being a skanky hoe. She's so self-absorbed from her desire, she sticks her foot in it about Angel. And her desire remains constant throughout the episode, until it culminates in her bursting in while Oz is trying to shackle himself. She gets a handle on it at the end of the episode, and it's fitting that it's Willow that takes down the Oswolf, exerting control over the uncontrollable. In the end, she seizes her desire, she chooses Oz despite him being a werewolf, and she initiates their kiss. And essentially, this is our message for Buffy. Buffy, like Oz and Larry, has gone through a painful, transformative experience as a result of her desire. She gave in to her passion, and now her boyfriend is a monster. Giles, her metaphorical mind, tells her, No, no bullets. No matter who this werewolf is, it's still a human being, who may be completely unaware of his or her condition. He's metaphorically saying that the werewolf, i.e. her desire, is still part of being a normal human. And it doesn't need to be killed, it just needs to be acknowledged and controlled. Now this represents an interesting dilemma for Buffy in regards to Angelus. We had Xander, a human, taken over by a hyena spirit, clearly not responsible for his actions during that time, so shouldn't be killed. We have Oz, who has no control over the werewolf, but is still a human most of the time, so shouldn't be killed. And we have Angelus, a vampire, the undead, now back to his natural state, a soulless demon. Last episode, we had this exchange. You come on. <sighs> no more of this, I've got a soul crap. What can I say? Hmm? It's going through a phase. Buffy realised at last episode that she was going to have to kill Angelus. Here, Teresa dies because she let him go last episode, and Buffy now bears that responsibility. 
bringing her love and desire for Angel under control, reconciling her feelings for Angel as he was with what he has become will be necessary for that kill to happen. One of my favourite parts of this episode is the nods to prior episodes as setups and reminders for future episodes. You get Oz checking out the cheerleader statue, which now contains Amy's mum from Witch, and Amy will appear next episode. Xander accidentally reveals that he remembers the events from when he was possessed by a hyena spirit in the pack, which will play into the spell that happens next episode. In the library scene with Willow, Buffy and Giles, you have a case of Giles mysteriously disappearing magical glasses, being visible in some shots and missing in others. Cordelia says Xander is wearing too much Obsession for Dorks, a play on the Calvin Klein fragrance Obsession for Men. Of course, next episode in Bewitched, Bothered and, Wild, and Bewildered, Xander has Amy cast a spell which backfires, essentially making all women who see Xander, except Cordelia, obsessed with him. He will literally be magically covered in obsession for dorks. My favourite quote is this one. That's pretty much the reason I called. Um, I want to ask you something. Is Jordy a werewolf? Uh-huh. And how long has that been going on? Uh-huh. It's so nonchalant and casual and so perfectly Oz. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. It helps the channel a lot. You can also support the channel through our Patreon. If you disagreed with anything I said or have anything to add, please put it in the comments below and I will see you next video.